Eli Gelb stars in the play Stereophonic on Broadway. I'm David Buchanan with Gold Derby. Eli, I feel like Grover is such a favorite character of audiences because he really is like the heart of the piece. There's so much dysfunction going on. And not that the, he doesn't have his own baggage, but he just seems so good natured um, and really helps kind of steer the ship through the show. Um, what do you admire most about your character? I mean, yeah, I think he covered a lot of it. Uh, he is sort of like, in a lot of ways, kind of an everyman, but he's an un unlikely one. Um, and that's sort of how I see myself too. It's like, uh, I think there's a lot to relate to. I think I've got a good heart. Uh, and also, you know, it's hidden under some like, so, some like less sort of, um, what's the word? mainstream qualities uh and so you know i think that's a big piece of it that that you know there's room for idiosyncrasy in the role um but like yeah at the same time you kind of have to keep it at bay a little bit uh which is a fun balance to play with um i think also uh grover's like one of one of my favorite things about all the characters in the play really is how complex they are. Um, and, and for as lovable as Grover is, he also isn't perfect. You know, I mean, it's the 1970s. He's a straight man. He's pretty misogynistic when you first meet him. Um, and I think that's an important, um, thing to sort of acknowledge in, in, uh, in all men <laughs> really um to to sit with and um and really like allow growth from um and so the fact that that's like sort of the baseline starting place where you know and then you're able to see that he has a good heart um you know within that container uh i think that's a really special uh quality for a character who's a straight man uh right now um to 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 uh to exp to have to have an audience for um you know yeah yeah it's a it's a tricky role as you're saying it's a very complicated character all of the characters are are complex as you're saying and i feel like there's an added layer in this show because seven of your five of your seven ensemble members have to play instruments they really are performing every night Yep. And then you and and your your compatriot at the soundboard, you know, are doing technical work there too. Like I wanted to ask you, how much did you have to learn, and how did you prepare to, you know, show that Grover has command over, you know, the soundboard and and can actually do his job? And we see that grow during the show. But how much did you have to prepare just to do the technical aspect of the show? That's a great question. Uh, so yeah, I mean, basically, like everybody in the band, um, aside from Simon, who uh, Chris Stack, who plays Simon, who plays the drums in the band, he was sort of drumming around this level before. Uh, everybody else kind of like had to step their game up from for to one degree or another, uh, in a pretty significant way. And so, um, that was that was a lot. To, you know, there was like when we first did it at Playwrights Horizons we uh it was like the first half of the day was just rehearsal for the band musically um and then you know and then we would come in and we would do scene work um and yeah it it uh I, it sort of fell on me and andrew to like find the time outside of you know the sort of structured um rehearsal to like figure out how we were going to convince people <laughs> that we knew what the heck we were doing uh at these controls and we did get some help from um you know uh will butler who wrote the music um a former member of arcade fire uh put out a few of his own albums just like an incredible incredible artist uh but he's you know he's been in tons of studios um, our our uh, music director Justin Craig is uh, is also like a producer, 
So he, he, you know, knows that side of things too. Although like neither of them had really had much experience like with a board because now everything's like, you know, it's like simulations of a board on the computer screen. Um, Ryan Rumery, who does the uh, sound design is incredible. Uh, did like a total magic trick with the show. Um, so we had people we were able to sort of consult with. They also, they've been recording an album um, to accompany this and like that has some of the songs and some extra stuff too. And so we were able to be in in the room for those sessions too and ask questions for, to the real engineer there. Um, I also, before we started rehearsals, I talked to a friend of mine who does like composition for um, for video games and stuff, but he's sort of a nerd for, uh, you know, like, and he actually lent me a, um, a you know, biography, an autobiography written by uh, the, the engineer for the Beatles. Um, and so I read through some of that um a lot of a lot of wikipedia a lot of googling um and just yeah asking questions and stuff uh yeah yeah it I'm really glad, I'm glad it looks like it <laughs> no it it really does and i wanted to take us to one of the scenes where it really kind of jumps off the stage which is when the band is recording masquerade and you're you know really trying to get the tempo right there's this long you know every take is is off and Grover has kind of stepped into this role where he was being berated for not being on top of this kind of stuff. And he finally really steps up to the plate. I wanted to ask you about your role in that scene because the kind of play dynamics of the drama are so complicated, um, especially you and Chris Stack are really kind of going at it about that, um, that track. Um, but then, you know, when they're playing and the music is so terrific and the, the song is incredible, you know, what role do you have in in making that come across? I mean, are you controlling levels on stage live? What what of what of that is you versus the sound design? And what kind of role do you play just in bringing that scene across? Because Grover is so integral to the drama of that moment. Totally. Yeah. I mean, so most of that is just in the in like is a, is a dramatic a, a dramatic uh, uh, contribution that I make. You know, it's. Um, in terms of like technical stuff, there's really not much I'm doing in that piece of the play. Uh, but, um, you know, some of it, like, like I turn up the fader for the, when, when we plug the click track into the patch bay, like, you know, when we did the fir first round of the production, I was like, all right, so yeah, we, we had to figure out, okay, that'll go into the patch bay. Uh, and we were like happy with that. But yeah, then we were in the studio and it was like, oh, of course, that needs to be on a channel and that channel needs to be turned up. So, uh, you know, like small little things like that. But that's that's, you know, again, that's me like doing the pretend thing when the band is doing the real thing. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's a really interesting scene to bring up that there's like a. The, the getting the tension there and the sense of sort of like what Grover is up against in order, like what he needs to basically surmount in order to do the thing that, to serve the song, uh, that needs to be felt, but you also have to feel strength in him. And you also have to feel like that strength isn't sort of, um, uh, what's the word, like, um, reckless uh so it's sort of like yeah it's so much about playing this role has been about finding a balance and finding like it's really a fine line to walk in terms of like how much how much do you want the audience to pay attention to you how much are you serving just the rest of the scene I mean like I think for so much of the play Grover sort of serves as punctuation for 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 the rest of the scenes playing out and uh that's a part of the job I enjoy and uh and yeah, also it's just like, you know, finding balance in all kinds of ways in terms of like, well, okay, but he is confident, but he's also in over his head. And, you know, it it's like, there's a lot to sort of find and I didn't find it until we were really running through it the first time around, um, like from top to bottom of the play, because I just didn't know where the sort of bounds were. Um, but yeah, I think that's a really good example of like where you had to sort of strike a balance and yeah. 
I do love those scenes where Grover does take kind of center stage. Like you have a wonderful moment with Will Brill um, talking about kind of, you know, in abstract sense, the meaning of life. And, you know, he's, Reg is espousing life should be about enjoyment and Grover disagrees. I think it's such a striking character moment. What do you think is underlying that philosophy? Because, you know, to that point in the play, he is kind of getting better at the job. He's being taken more seriously. He clearly, as you're saying, is competent. You know, maybe he is over his head, but, you know, they're producing a good result. So it's it's surprising to hear, you know, the kind of pessimism of Grover's outlook on life. But what what do you think is underlying that, you know, moment and his kind of outlook on, you know, his life? Sure. I mean, I'll speak from experience for a second and just say probably depression. <laughs> uh that's probably got a lot to do with it um but also you know i mean the reality of the world is that yeah like like reg says it is beautiful and but also it's so tragic <laughs> and um holding both of those things is pretty overwhelming and and uh and i think you know i think grover in the play really is like he he's a sensitive soul and he makes room for everyone's reality in a way that I think like the, the other character more so than the other characters do uh at any given moment and that becomes part of what is so sort of torturous <laughs> for him that the, the, like holding space for everyone's valid feelings uh when it's everyone's and they're opposing is a lot um and uh i think one of the things that grover is sort of holding in that moment is reg's pain that he's not able to sit with um and also the pain that he you know i mean reg reg kind of stole his girl <laughs> um and he's telling him, be happy. What are you telling, you know? And he's like, get out of here. Um, but also at the same time, it's like, you know, he hears him saying these things and he's, it's almost like there's a, there's a real loneliness in that of like, you know, if we could, if you could be real with me and I could be real with you, we'd both be a lot better off. And maybe then I could be happy, but you know, I don't know. So I think, I think that's a piece of it. And I think also just like the, it's two sides of the same coin. It's like, you try to buck up and and look on the bright side when you're having a bad day. And then when you're having a good day, you're like, oh, wow, people are dying, you know? And it's just, I mean, like, and it doesn't even have to be some tragic thing, like what we're looking at every day right now. It's, it's sometimes it's just, uh, yeah, everybody dies. We all lose our parents. We all, we have fractured relationships with our parents. We have, you know, whatever it is, it's like, there's just a lot of pain in, in life and that's just a part of life. And so sort of vacillating between those two things is just, uh, is also a part of life. And I think it's so well encapsulated in that scene. Yeah, it really is. And it is also in your relationship with Peter. Um, when I spoke to Tom the other day, he said something I thought was really interesting, which is by the end of the play for Peter, all of the relationships are in such bad shape, but he really feels like if he has any connection with anybody left, it's with Grover. You know, he mm -hmm. calls Grover a brother. Um, love that he that, yeah, yeah I, I, I just love that. And I love the moment at the end you have with uh, Sarah Pigeon where she kind of says, yeah, everybody, you know, kind of knew Grover's lie about his credentials, but Peter, mm -hmm. you know, wanted to give him a chance anyway. I just wanted to ask you about their relationship because at times it's it's kind of the worst dynamic. I mean, you're getting throttled by, you know, Tom every night on stage at that pivotal moment, but there's something brotherly about it too. Like what, how do you kind of see their dynamic, especially as it unfolds? Yeah, a hundred percent. I think that, you know, I mean, it kind of goes back somewhat to what I was saying before about like Grover makes space for, and, and is curious about where everybody's coming from. Uh, kind of at all times and like I think sort of in a way that makes sense with his uh job he's always listening like literally like there's that scene where you know 
um, Diana and Peter are off stage and he's listening. You know, to, to, to me, when he comes into that room for that final scene with Peter, he comes in right after Diana leaves because he's had his ear at the door, you know? Um, and so he's, yeah, he, he, he knows what's going on with people or, you know, makes an effort to. And I think that he really, you know, when the play starts, he's, he's, he's enamored with Peter. Peter's a rock star and, and, and a good one and really good one. And he's into him, you know, he's like, this is awesome. I'm so glad to be here, you know? Uh, and then he sort of starts to see the cracks in him and, and the cracks that sort of like become toxic for everyone. Uh, and they wear on Grover too, but um, I don't think he ever really loses sight of what Peter brings to the table. And, and I think, you know, ultimately like, the reason that the band is successful is in large part due to Peter and his um, his exacting quality uh, about the music and his passion for it. Um, and I think that's, that's something Grover understands. I think, you know, I think he also sees the pain in Peter uh, and that that, you know, that being sort of the root of some of his less than desirable behavior. Um, which doesn't, you know, excuse it, but it does provide some context. And um, I think, yeah, in some ways their pain is similar. Uh, the other thing I'll say about that scene with Sarah at the end, which I think is so beautiful, um, and I love playing that scene so much. Uh, we just, we kind of found so much in it just organically along with Daniel, and it's all in the writing, but it's also like, it's not right there in the writing it's deeper and we like barely talked about it and just like so much has bloomed from it and I it's been sort of like the most beautiful experience I've ever had acting was to just like with with Daniel and Sarah to like kind of organically find so much there um and and have it be there night to night uh but yeah I think so, you know the secret of that scene for me is that when she says um Peter Peter pushed for you that is touching to Grover and I think that's what hits a lot of the audience members but I think the other thing that hits Grover that might not register for other people I'm not sure uh is that as soon as he hears that it's also like why why is that nobody else did he's been abusive to me the whole time. And I think there's a, there's, there's sort of reflections of each other in that scene, uh, uh, Diana and Grover. And even in the stage directions, they're actually, David talks about the reflection of them in the uh, studio window. Um, and I think in that moment, Grover sees him and himself and Diana as, as, you know, sort of, uh, siblings of abuse in a way, uh, and, 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 but also respect because the thing is Peter does love Diana deeply, does respect Diana deeply as an artist. Uh, and also because of who he is, like needs to exert control over close relationships. And so Grover's like, oh, wow, he picked me because he could, he knew he could push me around. And, you know, so that's, that's the dual thing in that scene for me and in that moment. And also, I mean, yeah, there's just so, so much duality woven throughout the play. It's like a, a character of its own. And, and David's talked a lot about that. Um, and, you know, even in terms of like the way that the stage is set up, that there's like two spaces um, that are distinct. Uh, yeah, I love, again, and it comes back to sort of the way I answered the first question, just like complexity in all of the characters and and some, some a, a plot point actually meaning it's the thing that it means and it's opposite at the same time. Uh, and that happens like throughout the play, it's kind of mind blowing. Um, 
I don't even remember the original question, but that's my long answer. No, it's perfect. I mean, I think you're really encapsulating just how brilliant the writing is and also how brilliant all of the performances are, including yours, Eli. Um, congratulations on Stereophonic. Thank you so much for talking to Gold Derby today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I, uh, I, I very much appreciate it. I'm enjoying, between the fact that, uh, that, that men's hair and makeup is called grooming, I'm learning, and also this this gold derby thing, I'm very much enjoying thinking about myself as a horse. Truly, it's like it's a fun it's a fun image. So um, thank you, and it was wonderful talking with you. Uh, you have you have such insight about the play? So thank you. Mm -hmm.